Hello everyone, this is George Weigel speaking to you again virtually, but looking forward to being with you next week on Palm Sunday. Today's station church, St. Peter's in the Vatican, is one of the most familiar sites in the world, ranking with the Taj Mahal, the Eiffel Tower, and the Empire State Building as embodiments of a culture and a society. In this case, Christian culture and the society of the church. St. Peter's in the Vatican is many things. It's an architectural marvel. Its original plan by Donato Bramante having been altered slightly and improved, particularly in terms of the dome by the great Michelangelo. It's an engineering marvel. The 137 foot span of the dome continues to amaze centuries after it was built. It's a decorative marble. Imagine what it would have been like to be John Lorenzo Bernini and to spend 57 years from 1623 to 1680 designing and executing the decoration of this vast space. In the television age, St. Peter's has become the stage of global Catholicism. It's also a great papal cemetery. 91 popes are buried in St. Peter's. But basically, St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican Basilica, is the world's greatest tombstone the tombstone built over the grave of the Apostle Peter. How did that happen? First of all, let's say a word about the grave. Some of you may have had the opportunity to take the wonderful Scavi tour, the tour through the excavations beneath the grotto of St. Peter's Basilica. That tour is possible because during the Second World War, Pope Pius XII quietly authorized the excavation of the territory, the ground beneath St. Peter's, and there archaeologists discovered, among other things, an ancient Christian cemetery. And there were discovered what we can know with as much certainty as archaeology gives us, were the bones of Peter the Apostle. How did it happen that this man, a fisherman from the east end of the civilized world, as the Roman Empire understood the civilized world, come to be buried there? and come to have the world's greatest tombstone built atop his mortal remains. Peter, of course, is a curious character in the New Testament. He's a man of great faith, but he's always getting things wrong. And yet he is the rock on which the Lord Jesus chose to build the church. This weak man with whose many weaknesses and acts of disloyalty I'm sure we can all identify in one way or another. This weak man, having met the risen Lord, was transformed into a great witness and became the church's first great evangelist, as we will read in the weeks after Easter, as the church reads virtually the entire book of the Acts of the Apostles in the weeks between Easter and Pentecost. It's Peter who gives the first great 
evangelical sermon in Christian history, attracting some 5,000 converts, we are told, on the first Christian Pentecost. That transformation from weakness to witness is something we have been pondering throughout the itinerary of conversion that is Lent. All of us sin, all of us fail to live up to the expectations we have of ourselves of living the Christian life. But we too can be transformed into witnesses, as another story of St. Peter reminds us, and that of course is the legend of the Quo Vadis, Where Are You Going?, which the Polish novelist Henryk Sienkiewicz made into a great novel uh, over a hundred years ago. According to that legend, as Nero's persecution was beginning, Peter flees Rome. And on the Via Appia Antica, as he's living, leaving Rome, he meets the Lord. And Peter says to him, where are you going, Lord? Quo vadis domine? And the Lord replies, when my vicar leaves my people, I must go to Rome and be crucified again. Peter immediately repents, turns around, converts, and returns to Rome where he meets his fate in Nero's circus. A reminder that repentance, change, and conversion are always available to all of us.